My name is Torsten Orgard. I'm a Danish photographer. I travel the world taking photographs and teaching photography. Some of my upcoming workshops are going to be in Chicago, New York, Caramel by the Sea, Savannah, Havana, Cuba, Berlin, London, Paris, Tokyo, Kyoto, uh, basically all over the place. But there's a schedule, uh, you can click on the link below the video or go to my website and you can see the travel schedule, what is happening uh, this year and next year. Today I will talk about the Leica M11 one year later, meaning one year's experience. Before I get into the M11, remember below the video there is linked to a free ebook I wrote about iconic photographs and iconic photographers like Elliot Erwitt, Henrik Tebesong, uh, Nick Ut, and others. And I also write why I take photos and how I take photos. It's a free book, you just put in your email, in a matter of minutes you have it. Also, I put in some other goodies today. So if you edit in Lightroom, there is a, a preset style package for you that normally is $48. You click on the link and you put in the code and it's free. And similarly, the same package for Capture One, if you use Capture One for editing. And the idea of them is that it gives, uh, you could say, the Leica look, uh, but mainly perhaps uh, there's some really good black and white uh, conversion tools. What have I learned from using the Leica M11 for a year? Uh, this camera came out the 13th of January 2022 and you could say nobody in the right mind would release a camera on the 13th but nevertheless like it did and I actually think they got away with it. The very short review uh, which basically it is is that this is very similar to uh, the previous Leica M cameras, digital cameras. Uh, what this have is it have exceptional good battery time. It has a big chunky battery like this and as a new thing you just pop it out of the bottom here. Uh, and the great thing about this battery is it lasts, it seems almost it lasts forever. I do have uh, spare batteries but I seldom use them. So if I go around and photograph for a whole day in a city or somewhere, I can usually get by with one battery. And also it does have a USB-C connection down here. Uh, so whenever you're nearby your computer or somewhere, you can actually charge the camera directly with the camera into it. You don't have to take out the battery and have the charger and so on. So that's one great thing about the camera, the Leica M11. The other good thing is that it has uh, electronic shutter. So that means traditionally a Leica is a very uh, mechanical camera, you could say, uh, and the maximum shutter speed here is four thousand of a second. So Leica also have some extremely nice low light lenses, which means it's like f.95 or f1.4. And if you have a shutter time that the fastest shutter time is one four thousand of a second, and you have a beautiful lens 1.4 and you want to shoot that lens wide open in sunshine because that looks really beautiful. You could say part of the lens design is how does it treat the light and the depth of field and the so-called bouquet, which is bouquet means how pleasant or unpleasant the background looks. It comes from wine. Um, <clears throat> but if you want to take pictures in sunshine with a Leica lens wide open, then you would normally use an ND filter. So that's a neutral uh, density filler, it's simply some sunglasses for the lens. So you reduce the light with two, three or four stops. Uh, everything is the same, contrast and colors and everything, but it's just less light coming through. That's how you used to do it with an electronic shutter now, when there is so much light uh, that one four thousand of a second is not fast enough, then it goes into an electronic shutter and you can go up to 16,500 of a second. So that means now you have the freedom. You can say there's a lot of freedom in just those two things. You can take the camera out, it has battery enough, and you don't need fillers for your lenses. Um, you can say as a side remark to that, also um, <coughs> the camera have internal battery, uh, internally memory. Uh, so that means the SD card is here. And the one I have in here is 128 uh, gigabyte, which will get me uh, pretty far. Uh, should I have forgotten to put in my SD card again, the camera has 60 gigabyte of internal memory. So I will never risk that I go out somewhere and I don't have any memory card. I do have 60 gigabyte internal memory. And another side remark is that it now goes 64 uh, uh, ISO, <coughs> which is kind of like a, a, a 
hidden reference to Kodachrome 64. And you could say that maybe is the only reference to uh, Kodachrome. And let me get into that. So I could ask myself uh, better battery life and I don't have to use uh, ND fillers. Was that worth uh, $9,000 for the Leica M11? And in a way, the answer is no. Then again, I tend to just get like the newest model and I keep the old ones. Uh, so that's my story. And it's not that I'm unhappy with the M11. On the other hand, I'm not happy either. It's just like it's a new model. Uh, and one of the things that you say that makes me less enthusiastic about this camera than previous models or other cameras is uh, several things. So one thing is that it is a new Leica M and it has some improvements like the battery, electronic shutter, blah, blah, blah. But it also has a layer of complexities that have been added because you could. And because of course, uh, how do you get somebody to have a camera that can last for 10, 15, 20 years? How do you get them to buy the new one? Well, you do it by hyping it and say this is 60 megapixel. Now you can do this and that. And of course, you try to make it make it sound like this is something you can't live without. Um, and of course, in reality, you can and, and kind of you also know. But you need an excuse to buy it. And the camera provides a lot of things that you could say ends up standing between me and taking the photograph. It's just one thing you say when I get uh, a new camera. Uh, you could say I tested. It. It's not that I'm actually testing the camera, but what I am doing is I'm finding out how do I get this thing to work. And with the Leica M11, I have done the same as I've done with previous models. So I've done a video masterclass how to set up the menu, how to use the camera, the focus, the EVF, uh, everything and the whole history of the system. And there also is a book coming with it. And there's also presets coming to make uh, the work simpler in post-production. Post so that's, there's a link below the video, but that's my Leica M11 uh, video class, and it also exists for M10, M240, M9, and there you go. Um, the real serious uh, problems, so let's just talk about that. So, so this is, the simplicity of it, this is like an M, just like any previous Leica M digital, it does take pictures, it is a camera. Uh, it can do all the things that the previous models can, higher and they can do it higher resolution and I just said better battery time and electronic shutter that's like the main news of it. And then it have a little bit too many complexities which we've seen it before when like I had the M9 beautiful camera and that camera alone doubled uh, the size of the company that's how popular it was. Uh, then came the M240 after that and that one was also layered like this was layered with extra things that people had asked for and Leica had been, I would say, stupid enough to just implement because if people want it, then they probably want it. So they put in video and other stuff uh, and it turned out people actually didn't, want, they didn't really want it, like, or maybe some other people wanted it, but the people who actually bought the camera they didn't like video. And that's why we got M10, that was like a simple camera again. Uh, and you could say that is kind of like the style of Leica is that it has to be simple. That's one of the things I like about the like camera bodies is that they're simple. Because I don't want a lot of stuff between me and the picture. I want to see the picture and be able to take it. And that means that it should be pretty muscle memory how things work. You shouldn't be in the camera uh, to change stuff. So anyway, uh, <laughs> they didn't learn from the M240. They added a lot of stuff in the M11. And of course in M12 we're going to see a really simple perfect camera again. So let's talk about the actual uh, problems or minus things about the M11. Uh, one thing, if you go online on forums, you will see that some of the M11 have been bricked, which means the camera is completely dead. It is like a brick, it can't do anything. Or you will see somebody that have changed uh, the motherboard or whatever it's called in the camera. Or you would have other cameras that freeze. Uh, these things are minorities. It might, when you look at a forum, it looks like it happens to 90% of the cameras and it doesn't. It is very rare. I think I heard about five uh, Leica cameras that bricked uh, and you just send it back to the dealer or the factory when you get a new camera. Very simple. Uh, frozen cameras, maybe this froze on me two or three times. 
is not really a concern. Uh, if you have the correct SD card uh, and it's formatted correctly, then it will kind of usually work forever. The camera can still freeze, but usually when a camera freezes, it is a SD card problem. So then you change to another SD card or you go with an internal memory that doesn't freeze. Uh, and apart from that, yeah, it can still freeze. My iPhone also freezes and I even had a car that froze on me. Um, so that's not really a big concern. A camera that freeze, you turn it off and on and use it as solves it or you take out the, the battery and put it in again and you reset the camera and there you go. So not really uh, a big concern and I mean it is electronics, it is a camera, it's something you buy, there's warranty, you can send it back, you can get a new one. So that's not really my worry. Uh, one of the problems I really had or and still have with the Leica M11 is colors. And you could say that M11 had very, let's call them interesting colors. I might put a subtitle that says something, what that means. Um, but what it means in practical life, you say that you could decide, I love these colors. Because they're very colorful and they're very something. They're not Kodachrome colors, so the 64 ISO on the camera is not a reference to the colors of Kodachrome. If it is, that's not what you get. So the strange thing is, like I talked about it previously in articles and videos, is like I go take photos in East Berlin and you have uh, the sidewalk is gray. But in the photos it has a color. So now I have to figure out how, where does that color come from. And it's not the weather, it is something the way the camera sees uh, light. And I have to clean it out, I have to find a way to clean it out. Uh, similarly, I'll take pictures of anything else, but many could say, as soon as you have skin tones in a face, skin tones is kind of like always like the, the skin tones have to be beautiful. And that means they have to be clean, they cannot be bluish or too much magenta, too much yellow or anything, it has to be clean. Um, and that is a problem once you don't have clean uh, colors, then you have to figure out what do I do with this. And that's actually not something I want to sit and spend my, my time on. I, I think it's terrible enough that I have to edit my photos. Uh, if I also have to figure out how to correct something that shouldn't be correctable, that should be right the moment I pick it out, uh, then it's a little bit annoying. The solution that's more on it in the video masterclass and in the book that I made, uh, but you would say the solution I found is you take a white balance card like this and it's something I used in the past also with the M9 and other cameras and what you do is simply when you take for example a, a portrait or you want to take a picture of a building where it's important the colors are right or flowers or something, you put this white balance card in front of that thing and you take a picture of it. And you can also set the camera, uh, so you go in and set up uh, white balance manually. So that means you take a picture of this and now the sensor is calibrated uh, to, this, to the exact colors. Uh, but generally you could actually just walk around in the city or anywhere and take pictures. And whenever you have uh, now and then, you take a picture as a reference point, just take a picture of this one. So for example, I will stumble into a vintage car, I'll take some photos and I think, okay, I know when I edit this, it's the sun is low, it's close to sunset, it's, it's like very interesting light. Uh, and I want to get the colors right in this thing. So I'll just put this in front of the car, take a picture, and I might do it in sunshine and in shade, so I have it for later. And when I edit the photo in Capture One or in Lightroom, I can click on the white balance card and it will calibrate the colors to the correct colors. Um, <clears throat> and you can say, why is that necessary? Well, it's, it's necessary, you can say the white, also white balance in the M11 is actually pretty good. Uh, I almost, I used to set my daylight ISO or daylight uh, Kelvin for 5400 uh, as a general rule. But with the M11, I actually find I can put it on outer white, white balance and it looks pretty uh, good. But it has this, uh, interesting colors and what I mean by interesting colors is that normally you adjust colors in white balance so that means you go warm or cold in Kelvin um, and that would that would make it look right but then you also have part of the white balance adjustment is uh, hue so and hue is like you go magenta or green and that's not normally something you would touch and you would say, as a general rule for the M11, you have to go minus 6, 8 in hue 
or sometimes even 20 or 30. But as a general thing, you could actually you could make a rule say everything I import minus eight, and then it's gonna the balance is gonna be okay. But if you take a white balance card, then it calibrates the whole image to this, and you could say the why the reason it, it works this one is not that it's gray, but it is that it's neutral gray. Uh, so when you take a photo of this, uh, the camera and also Lightroom and Capture One knows when you put a point on this one, this one have to be neutral gray. So it can't have any blue, orange, or anything else, or magenta, whatever. So it basically calibrates the whole thing. Uh, you could also, if you use Lightroom, <coughs> you can use the x uh color passport. So I simply just put up the whole color passport, take a picture of it in front of something, and then there's a, a part of the software on Lightroom, you can adjust the whole thing. It looks beautiful, but you're also carrying around uh, an x right color checker. Uh, to get the colors right, that's a little, that feels a little bit uh, too odd, but sometimes, I'll do it because now I really want all the colors to be perfect. But else you could say this one is $18 or something on Amazon or being hates photo and online and that will solve it. It doesn't require a battery. You can put it in your pocket with your credit cards um, and that solves that problem. Another thing of great interest when we talk Leica is black and white photos. And I mean this is not a monochrome camera but still uh, a lot of the photos that I take and most people take with a Leica color camera or any color camera is going to end up in black and white. And one thing you have been able to do, uh, you could say since the Leica M9 came out here in 2009, uh, one of the tricks uh, was that you could, you always take uh, RAW or DNG and that's always going to be color because a DNG is like a download of everything the sensor recorded is put into a file and that's why it's quite a big file. What it means when you edit it in Capture One or Lightroom, you can just shadow details, color temperature and everything and you, it's very elastic because you have all the data. Uh, but at the same time you can also set it to also do a JPEG. Uh, and you said that would just be a quick way to get a JPEG, but a JPEG in color is not as beautiful as what you can make out of a DNG. So that's why you have to do DNG and you have to spend time editing them to, to beat out. Uh, the perfect colors and details and everything. But a JPEG then you could set uh, the camera to black and white and that meant that the preview you, you see on the screen here or uh, with the M11 when you put on EVF or you look at the screen behind it's going to be black and white and that makes it much more simple to judge exposure and sharpness and framing of a photo you don't have to look at the colors. The good thing about the M9 was then that when you took the, the JPEG straight out of the camera you had a black and white photo. It's very film-like, very beautiful translation because it is a translation that you have like a certain red color or not a certain but red have to be translated to, to this gray tone, blue have to be translated to this gray tone and so on and that's why when you look at black and white photo and you look at the skin tones, the skin tones look realistically and they look beautiful. Um, so this one had that uh, and you could say it really like it ever since the great thing was then like a made part of the firmware that you could select black and white JPEG but you didn't have to save the JPEG so now you just got the preview of the photo in black and white but you would only save the DNG or the RAW so that means when you import it everything was in color. Um, similar with this one you can uh, photograph and there's different settings so you can do different looks of the black and white JPEG uh, and you say the standard one or even I would say almost no matter what setting you set it to, the black and white just looks like shit. Uh, and what I mean by this is that <coughs> they look they're sharpened and they are increased contrast and for many things they actually look instantly very cool. Like great for Instagram and stuff, it's just, yeah, that's like, wow, that's black and white. Uh, but it took away a lot of the tones in the picture. Uh, but the main problem is as soon as you have a face in the photo you can see that the red channel is just translated totally wrong. So it's like you take a black and white photo with this one, that is the way to make your spouse or anybody else look 15 years older uh, and that is not a great black and white look. You say it doesn't really matter. Uh, I what The way I worked for a long time, the last five years, is I work in raw DNG and color and I would usually edit my color photo unless it's hopeless in color, but I'll edit and try to make the color 
into a good color photo and then I will make a virtual copy and I will use one of my presets to make uh, that into black and white and then I'm almost done uh, with the photo. Maybe I'll do a, some minor adjustment but generally if you have a color photo and you turn it into black and white uh, and you hit a preset for black and white, the ones I made, uh, it looks right. You could also just desaturate and you can increase contrast and brightness then you also have a black and white photo of the same uh, in, in most instances. But you could say what it indicates is that somebody, whoever dealt with the control of colors in this camera and translation to black and white, uh, I don't know, just somebody, nobody was home or it just went wrong or, you know, but and it's too late to change now. You cannot make a new Lightroom profile or a new Capture One profile and say, oh, let's translate the colors this way or change the whole firmware. Uh, that will have to be in another model. And that means this is something that I constantly have to fight with in this camera is how to get my colors right. So how did the M11 get so layered with uh, things that complicate things or comes between you and the photo you want to take? I think there's two uh, reasons for that. One is that you can. Uh, it's very easy to add stuff to firmware and make features. Um, and there's also a thing that you can say that is how you do things these days. I mean, we go back 100 years when the Leica M came out. It was an engineering thing and it was a matter of simplicity. And for example, here I have this catalog uh, from uh, the 30s or 40s. And this is just packed with all kinds of uh, accessories uh, that was made for the Leica. So you could do all kinds of special uh, purpose things with it. So you could say you have this fairly new technology coming out um, that enables people to take photos anywhere and anybody can do it and it's high quality. And then of course people have a quest, they want to do different things, they have different needs. Some want to use it in a laboratory, some want to use it on a mountain, some want a two meter long uh, remote release and the engineers would actually sit down and figure out how do we do this and also how do we improve the camera because there was lots of things to improve from 100 years ago till uh, recent. Uh, <clears throat> now we live in a different age and it is a fact Leica is a commercial business and when I look at Leica they're actually doing really well. The website is great, uh, they're building up a uh, a network of uh, their own Leica stores that have online sales, that have a user uh, area on the website where you can register your projects and so on. Uh, so a lot of things that have been really well organized at Leica to optimize it as a business. And fundamentally they spit out almost one new product a month, like a new lens or a new camera or a new something, a new model. Um, and that's great for business. That is kind of like how uh, many businesses are run today. It is a consumer race is a, is a matter of getting people to consume, buy, buy the next one and preferable <laughs> throw out uh, the old one. Um, and that is, uh, in that light you could say, yeah, then you have to make a Leica M11 that have some hype that make it sound like it's the, it's the new wonder. Uh, was it, really isn't because Leica M was always a one and you could say if you look at the introduction of the M11 it is a presentation like it's a new MacBook from Apple and I think that's wrong because this is not a high-tech product it's not supposed to be a high-tech product it's supposed to be simple and this made of metal so you could say it would be more interesting to make introduction of an M11 where you see people in the workshop working in metal and uh, precision optics and so on because that is what this camera is about. You know, other Leicas like the SL2 and the Q series uh, where it's more relevant to talk about technology where you can add wireless this and that and three layers of this and what have you. Uh, but the M users generally like simplicity and they kind of tend to like the older the better. Uh, and it is uh, a pleasure for anybody uh, or most like M users that you walk into a coffee store or you walk in the street and somebody says, oh, that's a nice old film camera you have there. Uh, because that is the whole look of it and the feel of it. This is an old film camera. Yeah, well, it's one year old, it's 60 megapixel uh, digital and you can transfer it wireless and you can put an Instagram in uh, a minute. 
Um, but the feel of it has to be old school. So that changed and you could say uh, what is relevant is uh, most people I meet in my workshop, a lot of the people I meet in my workshops and I talk to and I get emails from are people like me that they have uh, too many cameras that we can use them. Uh, so we buy one and we keep it, we buy the next one and often uh, we buy two of them. And sometimes we buy a special edition also because it's an interesting color or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so like I shouldn't be that worried if we're going to buy the M11 or M11P or M12 because it would take a lot for us not to buy it. But then a lot of the emails I get is people asking should I get the M11 or should I get the M10R, M10P uh, or even maybe a monochrome version. And you say uh, a lot of those people are new to Leica, they changed from Sony or whatever they did or they stop. They, they, they like to take photos with the iPhone, but now they want a real camera and they happen to like Leica. And then the question is, should I get one or the other? The simple uh, answer to that is you pick whatever makes you enthusiastic. So you can look at specifications of here's the M10P, my M10R is uh, at Leica for adjustment. Uh, and you look at the specifications of the M11. Uh, but it doesn't really matter with the specification. This is a camera, it takes pictures and it doesn't really it doesn't really change anything if you take one or the other. It is what based on what you know and what you see, what makes you enthusiastic because you are the essential part of taking photographs, not the camera. The camera is a tool uh, that you're supposed to like. Uh, factually you could say the M10 series have been uh, produced for, for five years. Uh, first the M10, then the M10P, then the M10R. This is a machine, this is some, a camera that can make pictures and you could say M10P and M10R is my preferred camera for just getting things done and take pictures. M11, we're working on our relationship still um, and I, we're not really there. I doubt we will ever, I will ever say like, wow, I really love the M11, this is the best like I ever had because I don't think it is. And you could say, the good thing is it that Leica should have learned from when they did the M9 here, the first full frame, uh, which doubled the size of the factory. That's how successful it was to make a full frame Leica. Uh, then came the next one is the M240. And Leica listened too much to people who said, oh, I want video, I want this and that, and can you do this, and can you add this, and I need more megapixel, and blah, blah, blah. And they were like stupid enough to add those things to the camera. And when the camera came out, uh, you could say, maybe the people who asked for video and so on never bought the camera, but the usual Leica M crowd, crowd and all the M9 fans, they bought the camera, expecting this is gonna be a better camera to discover this have a lot of stuff that I don't need, I don't like it. And like I listened to that and then came the M10, simplicity, and the things that was added was the ISO dial, which is great. Now you can control all the light from outside with aperture, shutter speed and ISO. You don't have to go into the menu to do that. Uh, and the menu itself is very simple. For some reason they didn't learn from that experience. They listened again and said let's add all kinds of stuff that anybody in the company and anybody outside the company can come up with. Let's just add it to the firmware and let's hype it up. Um, so the good thing about it is the M12 is going to be a really great camera. It's going to be <laughs> based on all this experience and going to be a real Leica. And then you can say that's another reason that you're going, you're going to sign up to buy that already now. All this said about the M11 and camera models what really matters actually is you. Uh, your enthusiasm for taking photographs and making photographs it is what is the most important and that's why you pick a camera and lens that make you enthusiastic and make it simple for you to take the photos. And um, you can say it's always about the photograph and that's one thing when I, for example, like SL2 is a camera that I think is too big to walk around with. I don't, there's a lot of things about the SL2 is not as charming as this, like M. Uh, but what I do is also I will use it and then I will look at the pictures I make. How does the picture look? How many do I make that are good? Uh, and that 
is a good test of, of course, any type of equipment is can it actually produce what I want to produce or is it just fun uh, as a gadget to have. Uh, and it is about the photograph and you could say uh, I have a couple of uh, workshops I'm doing this year where I'm going to have uh, a model, a male model and a vintage car and then we're going to use that uh, for a couple of hours to do photo shoot. And one of the interesting things uh, about that and you could say one reason it's a male model and not a female is it's about the photograph. So you have the photograph, you have the model and we are making a photograph. Uh, whereas you could say traditionally or very often if you have a female model she attracts a lot of interest and it very often becomes about making her look beautiful in a photograph. And you could say yeah people should look cool, beautiful and everything in a photograph but it's not about making her beautiful, it's about making a photograph that express something. And you can say that goes for all uh, photographs that you make. It's not, I mean, nobody looks at your photograph and says, is this what camera is this taken with or what lens is this taken with? They may, might ask about it because they think it's important, but basically it's not. I mean, you take a, a photo like this here. Um, <coughs> this is uh, Ted Baker and it's Herman uh, Leonard who took this. And you say, I don't even know what camera it was taken with, and it doesn't really matter. It's just a beautiful photograph, uh, and it has, it expresses an emotion. Uh, then, of course, you could say, yeah, you should, you should pick equipment uh, that you like to use and is simple. And let me just take as an example here uh, a new thing, <laughs> old thing, uh, regarding the household. Um, there's actually a Christmas gift for Leila. She has a Q2 monochrome and she also uses SL2 and she wants color. Um, and I got this uh, Leica M6 film camera. So Leica made this from 84 to 2002, 2003 and then they stopped production because nobody wanted to shoot film anymore. Uh, but in 2022 they decided let's put it into production again and it's a huge success. And I'll use this one and I'm just so proud of myself. I'm so cool. Uh, it's like totally cafe latte and everything. Uh, I'm having a film moment here and then Leila goes uh, Google and she says no this is a cool camera, this is a real uh, film camera. And this, this is 6.7, it's huge of course. Uh, it's a classic with the wooden handle, Pentax from Japan. Um, and and if you just listen to the shutter sound of this, this sounds like a helicopter running out of gasoline. Uh, this is pure, <laughs> pure booty. We we'll do it again. Um, and what it does is that it does photos like. Uh, I'll see if I can find one here. Uh, this is one uh, I commissioned. Uh, Danish uh, photographer Robin Skolborg did this for me. This is Ted Sørensen, and this is Kennedy's uh, speechwriter that uh, was a good friend of mine, and we were in Denmark and uh, doing different stuff and. Uh, there were some articles being written, uh, interviews with him, and then we needed some photos. Uh, so Robin, he, uh, Robin Skullboy, he used to use uh, this one. He would have two or three or four of them on set and have an assistant that would hand him a new one because it takes those 12 pictures in a roll of film. Uh, and it's just beautiful and this is a classic and you can have other cameras that is very lovely. From uh, Nikon you have the Hasselblad, uh, uh, different Hasselblad cameras. Uh, one is one very special one is the X-Pen uh, that funny enough is it's not hard to get but it really went up in price because it's, it's such a simple and beautiful camera uh, that do, does panorama photos uh, but that is the ses essence also that of course you you need some tools that you like to use so you use them and something you can trust can produce the result that you want uh, and it has to be not between you and what you're making. So you can actually make, you see a photo and you can make a photo. That's basically what a camera is there for. And speaking of cameras and technology and megapixels and all the stuff we can do and blah blah blah, uh, the important thing to remember is that you are making photographs. And it's a very unique thing and if, if you haven't thought about recently how unique it is, uh, that you can make photographs and you do make photographs, then, if, then realize I can go anywhere in the world and I can take, I can see something, I can take a photograph of it and I have an idea this is cool or this is, 
it makes me feel something or this is a great something. I will take the photographs and the crazy thing about it is that 5, 10, 20 years later that photo, somebody can look at it in one of my books on my website in a gallery in, in Japan or in uh, Austria and they get hit by that emotion. And there's not many other things where you can do that. Of course you can do it with writing and poetry and music and so on. But that is a unique thing that you could say most of you who are not professional photographers, you might have a day job where you actually don't create anything that has uh, an emotional impact now or ever, or it doesn't even matter in 20 years. But photography does. You take photos of your spouse or your kids or family or friends or landscapes or cityscapes and it's history recorded and it does have your expression and your emotion in it which is very unique. It's not about if you use this camera or this camera whatever, it is about using a camera that can express and record that whatever you feel about this and what you want to express of it. And that is uh, extremely unique and that is why it is also important that you get a camera that enables you to do that and not one that prevents you from doing that. Also one of the things I work on a lot right now is I have a lot of people in my workshops and people I get emails from and people I talk to. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, now we had, well we had photography around for a long time, we had digital along, around for a long time and one of the things you can do with digital and with iPhones and everything and computers is you can make a lot of photographs. Uh, so now you store them on a computer and you can say there is, there is one hurdle in photography and that is post-production or editing. And it's something I really hate doing. Uh, so you could say, I, I spend a lot of time, I have my, my survival kit for, I have my Capture One survival kit and my Lightroom survival kit, which is basically how to survive editing, how to get it done in high quality and fast, so you can get the picture that you originally envisioned, you can get it on the screen and on print, and you can archive and distribute it. Um, and you say most, a lot of the people I talk to these days is like, what, what do I do with my photos? So yeah, well, one thing is you have a camera and you wear a camera and you take the photo when you get an idea that's a photo, you take the photo and you import and you edit it and you store it with keywords and whatever, uh, so it's available. And you store it in a way so it doesn't get lost uh, if there's a glitch in the cloud or something. Because it is important to have in 10, 20 or 100 years, it's going to have value for somebody. So part of what you do is you store it in a way so it's accessible and can be used. But of course also like what to do with it. And my slogan is everything has to go somewhere. I don't write anything or photograph anything without the intention of it. It has to be used for something now or later or many thousands times or whatever or it has to bring joy to one person that I make a print for. So it has to go somewhere and that is the big thing that I work with right now is like how to do videos and classes and, uh, and books like how, how to inspire yourself to actually use the photos and get them out in distribution and make something, you could say, make something happen with the photographs. Um, so do you say that's the next thing that you will see more videos and everything about this because it is uh, a real thing. It's like you're not supposed to get a camera uh, that takes 60 megapixel photos and then just take photos and put them on your hard drive and nothing ever happens. It's, it's just not, it's not in the spirit of photography that you take photos, just nothing is going to happen to them. It is like you're making something and it is a communication, it should go to somebody, it should go somewhere. So however uh, all these different camera models might be, all the specifications, there is one great thing about photography and particularly about Leica and that is that lenses are forever. Uh, you might have heard diamonds is great but that's, and that might be true for some people, but lenses is uh, a great thing. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of it but just show here like some of the, the beauties I have here. Uh, so you could say whenever you sit uh, Saturday evening and uh, you need to do something, you can always browse uh, the internet and eBay and, and everywhere uh, for lenses. Uh, it's never wrong. <laughs> it's never wrong 
to buy more lenses. I mean, fundamentally, you could do everything with just one lens. I could basically just have a 50 millimeter and I wouldn't need anything else. And it could be like uh, the 50 I have on the M11 here is from the 50s and it's not very expensive or anything, but it's just an awesome, great lens. It's compact and everything. Uh, that doesn't prevent me from getting other lenses. Uh, this is a 75 1.4. It was the lens designer Peter Mandler's uh, favorite. They say it has a very soft and classic look, very detailed also, uh, a beauty. Uh, then you have here a 21 1.4. It's a very specialized lens that I actually don't use it a lot. I have made a few uh, pictures that actually won awards with it. Uh, and it is a lens I can put it on and say, okay, now I'm going to shoot 21 for a day or three days. And then that's what I do. And then I put it back on the shelf. A uh, very specialized lens. Uh, Excellent quality in all ways and you can say one great thing about it is that I think if I sold this one now I would get almost the same as I paid for it, maybe even more because of inflation. Um, and here's another one. This is a 92.0 uh, spherical and this is a lens I use uh, way too little. In some ways uh, I would hope in a parallel life I would only use this lens and that is because uh, it has this, the special Leica look that is very detailed, but it's not over sharp or sharp. So it's very crisp and very alive when you look at But what this thing has on top of that is something that you can say most Apo lenses has because it's the Apo Aspirical. Uh, what most Apo lenses have is to have very clear uh, colors. And this one has uh, magnificent colors. It's, it's, of course, it's great for portraits, but it's great for everything. And the colors you get from it is almost, I mean, they're brighter in a natural way than what you see with the eye. So it's almost like you just, you got better eyes uh, when you use this lens. And that's why I should use it more than I, than I do. Uh, but it's a lens, I seldom use it. And when I do it, uh, I'm always like, wow, this is <laughs> such a great lens. There's lots of lenses uh, of Leica and you could say, um, you can never get tired of buying and using lenses. Uh, again, you could say, I prefer to simplify life. So I'll go like, okay, 50 is my standard thing. And it's only if I want to have fun, I, I will go use another lens. Or if I have a real specialized purpose where no, I need 21 millimeter, uh, then I'll put on a 21. Having said all this, and yet uh, not everything, about the M11 and photography, I will add one uh, last thing for you that you can think about for a while. Well, before I say that, below the video there is a free download, so remember to click and put in your email and you will have either my ebook or my presets and styles uh, within minutes, so remember to do that. But the thing I want to leave you with is artificial intelligence. And that is uh, the big hype right now that uh, we're going to have artificial, artificial intelligence all over and it's going to be amazing or it's not going to be amazing. Uh, you could say it is fascinating you go on a website and you can type in some stuff and it answers or comes up with some stuff. Uh, it reminds me a little bit when I went to business school we had the first uh, computer system it was super expensive and you could type in a code of like five or ten lines in what was called I think it was Comal 80 or something uh, the language and then the machine by miracle you hit return and the machine has, uh, says hello and I was just like wow this is amazing and it was I don't actually know why it was amazing but it was that you could have a machine do something that you told it to do you could say artificial intelligence is just an expansion of that all over the place. Um, and as an example of artificial intelligence, um, I think eight, ten years ago I was doing an exhibition in the Leica Gallery Salzburg. Uh, and it, was, it is still the most uh, successful exhibition they ever had, meaning the one that sold for the most money of uh, prints. Um, but part of the exhibition was that I had to come up with an artist bio and I'm like, artist bio, what the heck is that? So I look around to see what, who, what is an artist bio and a lot of artist bio, if you go look at museums and artist website, it's, it's just, it's BS from one end to another, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and doing that research I stumbled into that you could do a bullshit bio. So there was a website where you could actually type in uh, a few keywords and we come up with a bullshit bio, which means it looks and sounds like a bio, 
which is comp completely bullshit from end to another, but it sounds very uh, intellectual and high end, and like somebody thought about this and you're inspired from some weird stuff. And that's the one I used for my bio, and, and nobody probably ever read it or understood it, it doesn't matter, it just had to be an artist bio. And that was a good example of what artificial intelligence is, because artificial intelligence is what you feed to a machine is what you get back. So you put something into a machine, or the internet, or wherever you put it, and you ask a machine to make a book, or an article, or a piece of text, it's going to come up with whatever is there. It's kind of like talking to Siri, uh, and you could say, if you, if you go on those sites and you put in uh, a subject that you know something about, you'll see uh, there's a lot of wrong information. And that's what you can see also if you surf around the internet, there's a lot of wrong information. Uh, it's not correct or it's bullshit. And what you do when you work with artificial intelligence is you have a machine uh, collecting all this, harvesting all the bullshit and putting it into a new bullshit <laughs> text. Um, and you said that is very fascinating and it might be useful if you want to do an artist BU or you need to hand in some papers for your school or somewhere, uh, or for the government, and you don't have a lot of time for it, you just have artificial intelligence make it for you. Um, <clears throat> but here's the problem, or well, it's not a problem, but here's the reality of artificial intelligence, and this is what you can think about for a while. Uh, my opinion is that what makes photography interesting is when I look at the photograph that you make, it is your viewpoint in that photograph. It's how you see the world and how you made it look for me. And you saw it, which is very unique, because we all see different things and we see it in different ways. And the way you make it is very uniquely you. You might not know that it's uniquely you, because you just do it like you always do it. But for other people, including me, who look at what you do, it is unique because I wouldn't have done it that way. I couldn't have come up with it that way. I could try to copy it, but I can't make the same. I can't make this original idea or little thought that you have. And that is what makes it interesting to read books, read articles, look at photographs, look at paintings, listen to music, is that there is a unique idea behind. Somebody came up with something that didn't exist before. And you could say that's almost, I mean, that is the miracle of art, is you make something out of nothing. And if you're really good at it, you only have to make it once and you can sell 20 million copies of it or 100 copies or whatever. Uh, but that is uh, the great thing about being an artist and a creator is you can create something and it can be copied many times. But no matter how many copies you make, it always has this original piece of you behind it. And that is the problem that artificial intelligence has nothing. It is like talking to Siri or anything or whatever you could Google. It is information put into it by somebody and it is mixed up, but there's no original idea in it. And you say, what? There's no life in it, so you can say that there's nothing to get inspired from, there's nothing to be touched by. It is it, artificial, as the name says, it's artificial intelligence, and you can say it's probably not very intelligent, so it's just artificial. So that is one reason to always wear a camera, and when you see something that you say, wow, that's a photograph, you take that photograph and you put it on your computer, you edit it to a stage where it's final, and you put it somewhere. That is uh, life, that is what we do, and that is why it is fun to have all these uh, small, <laughs> small beauties and we spend all the money on them. Um, that's what it's all about. So till I see you the next time, thank you for watching and remember to always wear a camera and believe in yourself.